Spray Tips with Tom Wolf is brought to you by Loveland Products, makers of LI700 penetrating non-ionic surfactant with Lesitec technology. To uh, my video log for this week, uh, we'll start off with the question of the week. Um, I, I was at a meeting yesterday and uh, one of the producers asked me, um, I find calibrating my sprayer a bit of a pain and I used to do it by hand. I used to measure the flow from the nozzles but I found the calculations difficult and they never really agreed with my monitor. So now I just let my monitor do the, cal uh, the calibration and he wanted to know whether that was a, an acceptable way to, to go forward from this point. And that's a really common question, it's a good one, uh, because the rate controller now does a lot of math for us. It uh, calculates, uh, it adds up the acres, it uh, uh, calculates the total flow that you've got coming out of the sprayer, and it uh, tells you how much is left in your tank, for example. Uh, a lot of different things uh, uh, can be calculated. But it only measures, the rate controller has a flow meter that only measures the total flow coming out of that boom. So uh, you know what's uh, leaving the, uh, the tank uh, and going to the boom, but you don't know what happens to it at the boom. So uh, it's possible for some nozzles to be malfunctioning, uh, for some leaks to occur somewhere, uh, for some blockages to, to be uh, present, for some pressure drop to occur, and you actually don't know what the actual distribution of the flow along the boom is. There's really no new technology there. We are still uh, basically looking over our shoulders, looking at the boom and saying everything looks good, and we go. Uh, but how do we know that actually things are good? The only way to do that is to actually physically take a measurement of each and every nozzle, uh, and to make sure that the, uh, the flow agrees with the flow of the other nozzles. And with the standard usually is about 5%, plus or minus 5% of the flow is an acceptable deviation. Um, usually if there's a nozzle that is not uh, flowing right, we replace it, uh, and hopefully that'll correct the problem or we clean it or take some other kind of action. Um, the other thing that we become aware of when we do that is uh, things like pressure drop. And uh, most of the time, uh, the, the, the pressure at the cab that we read in the, in, on the monitor is taken sometime before the spray reaches the boom. And uh, there's a significant plumbing after that point and pressure drop can occur there. So we need to know if that pressure drop is significant enough to affect the flow of the nozzles. Fortunately, most nozzles are not that sensitive to a small change in pressure, say 5 PSI. But if it's more than that, we ought to know about it and maybe take corrective action there as well. So there's no real assurance that the spray that you're uh, putting out your sprayer is uniformly distributed. So I think the answer to the question is that there's no substitute for manually calibrating the nozzle, collecting the spray from each nozzle for a uh, predetermined length of time. I'm less concerned about uh, doing the math afterwards. I'm a little more concerned about you know, making sure they're all fairly similar to each other. Uh, I do that the rate controller. I trust that the, the, the flow controller is, uh, is accurately calibrated and let the rate controller then do the, the 10 gallons per acre calculations, for example. So that's the, the answer to the question of the week. What we want to talk about this week is uh, the decision to purchase a new sprayer. Um, I think we're just coming off a, a pretty a busy uh, couple of months of trade shows. We have had Agri-Trade in Red Deer in November. We then moved on to uh, the crop production show in Saskatoon, uh, Farm Tech, and certainly Ag Days in Manitoba, all of which happened in January. And we're now uh, thinking, okay, what did we learn from this? And uh, typically what you see uh, at the, uh, the sprayer booth is, is uh, manufacturers are justifiably proud of their new sprayers and they will usually take the conversation a certain direction of, and it will take the direction of horsepower, it will take the direction of capacity, travel speed, boom width and those kinds of things. As often creature comforts are part of that, uh, suspension and so forth. And I want to challenge uh, the manufacturers to answer a few other questions I think that might be important to you or at least for you to ask those questions to yourself. So the first question really is, uh, it's on the back here, is what are your goals? Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you're thinking of spraying more uh, mature crops with fungicides and want to get into that, uh, into that business uh, for yourself instead of hiring it out. 
maybe you have an issue with spray drift. Uh, you've had a drift, uh, a drift complaint and you want to cover that. Maybe you are uh, concerned about just having the right uh, coverage and you need more capacity to get more water volume on and, and those kinds of things. So have a very clear picture of what it is that you want to achieve because it does set the trend for the questions that you'll ask uh, of, your, of your potential supplier. The second question and it usually revolves around capacity. Um, Capacity is probably the single most important thing in spraying today. Uh, getting more acres sprayed more often and on time. Agronomically speaking, the timeliness of the operation is pretty well at the top of the list. And we do that with acres per hour. And uh, so the question is, how do you get that capacity? There's a lot of different ways of doing it. And the, and the manufacturers will usually talk about travel speed. And they'll uh, highlight the fact that their sprayers can travel faster, more comfortably. Uh, they'll talk about boom width and booms are getting wider and it's much more common now to see the, the wider 120 foot booms for example, so that's a good thing. They'll talk about tank size and uh, talk about how long you can go before needing a refill for example. And those are all valuable and I won't uh, talk uh, in any detail about those. But they're, they may be overlooking some other things. Uh, and one of them is, is filling. And that's a question that I think should be asked and that is, um, how fast can your onboard pump fill this tank up? Um, some nurse tanks have a, a transfer pump on the nurse tank that is, has a certain capacity, you know what that is, but some people are still uh, drawing water in from the onboard pump and you want to know what some of those capacities are. What's the plumbing? Are you at three inch all the way to the tank uh, or are you still on two inch in some places? Uh, how, how, um, uh, how, how's, this, how's the material filtered on the way to the tank, those kinds of things. So conveniences of, of filling, I think. If you can reduce your fill time from say 15 or 20 minutes to uh, five or 10, uh, given that you've got enough time for hydration of some of the dry formulations, for example, I think you've got a significant capacity boost possible there. So do spend some time talking about filling. Cleaning is another one. When we move from one chemical to another, um, one of the most time consuming things is making sure your sprayer is decontaminated. So one thing that I'd like to see happen there is, is a, a better process for cleaning. For example, is there a separate clean water tank on board? Is that clean water tank, uh, has, does it have its own pump? Or, um, you know, and how do you, how do you get uh, that clean water into the tank? So you might want to ask, uh, you know, is it automated? Do I just press a clean button and it takes care of the thing for me? Or do I have to manually leave the cab, be stationary, and, uh, you know, flick a few uh, valves here and there and make sure that the booms are flushed and the return lines are clean? And then do I have to repeat that a few times to dilute the, the remainder all the time because the sump capacity might be fairly large? So those are the kinds of questions I think would be valuable to ask. If you can reduce your cleaning effort, again, from 10 or 15 or 20 minutes to the three or five minutes, I think that's a real productivity gain as well. Um, another one that is, that is very important is boom height. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the twin fan nozzles, for example, uh, operating much more effectively at lower booms. We also recognize that lower booms are, more, uh, are a very powerful way of reducing spray drift. Um, having the boom low and level uh, is important. How low does that boom go? That's a good question to ask. Not all high clearance sprayers can have a very low boom. Um, and secondly, you know, what kind of a boom sensor do you have and or do I have to go to third uh, aftermarket for that? And, and I really recommend that you look into getting some of those because they do uh, make the operation that much more safe and efficient. So boom height, a very important one. A spray pressure, uh, the single most important thing that really governs the performance of the, of the unit is the spray pressure at which you operate your nozzle. So any given nozzle can be operated at a good or a bad pressure and the spray quality, the spray pattern, and the overall performance uh, goes uh, along with that. So what I l typically look for is a, is a prominent pressure gauge. We want to have a pressure gauge that's in the field of view of the operator. We want the operator then actually to use that pressure gauge as their speedometer because there's an ideal pressure for most nozzles and travel at whatever travel speed uh, will bring that pressure, uh, uh, will make that pressure happen. So the rate controller makes a decision there based on travel speed. Uh, don't tie into a, a single travel speed and don't say I want to go at, at 12 or 14 miles an hour and then live with whatever pressure you have. Go the other way. Uh, go, go, to the, go as fast as you need to to get the pressure you need for best operation of that sprayer. 
then if you want to control drift you reduce your travel speed and you know at what pressure a, a coarser spray becomes important and if you want to improve uh, coverage for example you might go faster and increase the spray pressure accordingly so that's that that gauge has to be the thing that you look at most often in your cab um, Another thing to ask about pressure is where is the pressure taken? Is that an accurate reading of the nozzle pressure? Um, you might need to have a gauge on a nozzle body, for example, uh, to find out what the pressure drop from the gauge that's in the cab to the nozzle body actually is. If it's 5 PSI, you need to add that uh, to the pressure at which you're operating because that's the pressure the nozzle actually sees. And lastly, uh, monitors. Monitors are awesome now. Uh, you know, it used to be that you would have a monitor that uh, basically had a large toggle switch for on and off, and you had maybe an analog pressure gauge, and maybe a few boom section controls. Uh, later on, when we got we uh, got more electronic, we were able to enter a target application volume, and then the the pressure regulator would take over. Um, modern monitors are much, much more than that, and in some ways, they can be too much. They can be intimidating. Uh, I think it's important to have ease of use in a monitor system so that you can uh, have some confidence that the, the operator you're putting on that sprayer can do it without a lot of training or confusion or, or things that they might be overlooking. Uh, so make sure that you, you understand how it works and make sure you, you leave a message with the manufacturer that simplicity is still a good thing in some, in some places and uh, that would be a way uh, to do that. Um, so uh, that's a summary of it, really. I think uh, new sprayers are, are, are very sophisticated, uh, but there's a few areas in which I think we can still uh, work towards improvement, and this is uh, some of the things I would ask, ask of the manufacturers. And that's the vlog for this week.